here this morning. Christmas, boy, Christmas, it's, it's a call to hope. Christmas is a call to peace. It's a call to joy. And today, the Advent candle that's lit reminds us to love. John 3.16, familiar verse. This is how much God so loved the world that He gave His Son, His one and only Son. And today we're, we're going to look deep into the love of God. We're going to look at the predicament God had to deal with and the resolution to that predicament that He found Himself in. And finally, we're going to look at our response to be recipients of so great a love. So what we're going to do today is we're going to delve underneath the traditions and our celebrations of Christmas. We're, we're going to go deeper than the trimmings and the, and the trappings, the wrappings, the, the cards, to discover that, that love that is in Christmas. We're going, we're, that's what we're going to go for. Because Christmas is all about the coming of a Savior. Coming of a Savior. And to understand the love that's demonstrated in Christmas, we have to understand something about the attributes of God Himself. Those attributes are revealed to us in the Scripture. Now, an attribute is a, a one-word description of what God is like. Okay, It's kind of like His, his character. It's, it's kind of like this describes Him. If you would pick one word that would describe you, do you have one? Do you got one word that would describe you? Pretty tricky, huh? I got three. Cool, suave, and debonair. <laughs> okay, um. Well, God has, uh, in the scripture, we, we've, uh, scholars have come up with 28 attributes. And I'm not going to go over all those today, but I simply want to draw your attention to the attributes of His holiness, His love, and His <sighs> wrath. Now, we see examples of God's wrath in both the Hebrew Bible, which we Christians call the Old Testament, and in the New. John 3.36 says, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. That's good. But whoever rejects the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. It should not be uh, surprising that God would hate anything that is opposed to his holiness. Now, there, there's much to, we could say about his holiness, but for now it suffices to say that God is separate from all that is sin. Now, we have a working definition for sin around here. We say that sin is anything that deters, damages, or destroys right relationships. So sin is the label we place on anything that is not in accordance with God's intent. Okay? Now, if you consider sin a crime against God's holiness as kind of a, a personal affront to Him, you can understand why wrath passes judgment upon sin, condemns sin, passes sentence upon sin, and the perpetrator of that sin. So with that dynamic, uh, the words of the prophet really hit hard. They really hit hard. For in Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 20, the scripture says, the soul that sins is the one who will die. See, the holiness of God requires that anything that is not as God intends must be made right or destroyed. Yikes. Think about that one more time. Think about it. Anything that is not as God intends must be made right or destroyed. Within and flowing through God is His creation. <clears throat> a part of that creation, of course, is us. It's humanity. And humanity is created in the very image of God. And God endows us with free will. Free will. It's uncoerced volition. And, and it's necessary. It's necessary to be able to choose to choose that intimate relationship that God desires to have with every single human being. That intimate relation can, can only be entered into and cultivated by, by choice. You see, you can be forced to do many things. You can be forced to do all kinds of things. But you cannot be made to love what you choose not to love. No one can force you to love. Now in Genesis, the scripture reveals how the abuse of humanity's free will resulted in sin. And I put some verses together for you in Romans. The exact um, references are in your notes. 
Just as sin, the scripture says, entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all men, and women too, because all have sinned, and before the law was given, sin was in the world. Even over those who did not sin by breaking a command as Adam did, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death. See, God's wrath destroys everything that doesn't fit into Him or harmonize with Him. It just gets destroyed. And death, death is the warning of the curse that is upon all of us. Hell, hell is a symbol that we are given to describe the separation that exists between us and God. Now, the wrath of God brings hell and death on everything and everyone that is not in accordance with His intent, with the intent of His creation. So God's wrath condemns sin. And why? Because sin ravages all that is good, all that's beautiful, all the wonderful things He's made. You see, if you think about it, sin destroys unity. It enslaves. It deforms. It perverts. It oppresses. It murders. It hates. It hides the truth. You see, sin lies, offering pleasure, but soon just delivering pain. Remember the original temptation? Sin promises you heaven. Oh, you will be like God, but soon delivers hell. So God's predicament is that His nature is to enjoy an intimate, dynamic relation with each and every human being. While at the same time, His nature is to destroy sin. See, God's attributes of love and holiness, they create this inner tension within. How can He destroy the ones He loves? Yet how can He allow sin to remain? God's solution, the resolution to this predicament, is Christmas. See, God Himself enters His creation to save His creation from Himself. God incarnates, and and incarnates means to put a body on. And I don't understand how Jesus and the Father can be the same at, at the same time, but that is the mystery the Scripture presents to us. And in Colossians chapter 1, verse 19, the Scripture reads, God, in all of His fullness, was pleased to live in Christ. And through Him, God reconciled everything to Himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood shed upon the cross. See, Christmas is motivated by God's love for His creation. His love for you. His love for you. For you. For you. God enters bodily into His creation through a womb so that He can be human. And like Adam, Jesus is born unencumbered by the curse of sin. That's why I believe in the necessity of the virgin birth. In Luke chapter 1, verse 35, it says, So the baby to be born will be holy, and he will be called the Son of God. In a very real sense, Jesus undoes everything that Adam did, satisfying his own justice by sacrificing himself, the responsible party, and thus his love making an atonement for the sins of his creation. So Christmas is motivated by love. It's a love with which God seeks to restore right relationship with you so that things between you and him Maybe as He intended. Now, this Christmas, God has done everything He can to reconcile you to Himself. But He can't force you. No, see, He's blessed you with this free will so that you could choose Him. 
so that you could respond to His love by pledging your devotion to Him, reciprocating love. In order to receive that gift, you've got to do just the opposite of what Adam did. See, Adam chose to reject this righteous relationship with God through his disobedience. In order to receive God's Christmas gift, you've got to follow the example of Jesus who held obedience to God more precious than life itself. Consider these words of Jesus. They're found in Matthew chapter 13, verse 44. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy went and sold all he had in order to buy the field. You see, to receive this gift, you have to go all in. I mean, there can be no hedging of your bet. I mean, you believe that uh, you're subject to the wrath of God because of the sin in your life. And you believe that, that Jesus, by means of His blood upon the cross, makes it possible for you to be made right with God. That there's an atonement for all those things that you've done wrong. And then you commit yourself to a, the obedience of discipleship, asking God to accept your faith. And then God's gift of love just opens up for you. And those, those who have received the gift of Christmas through faith in Christ, then they allow this love to transform them, to change them from the inside out, conforming them in their character, their nature, their attributes, in accordance with the attributes of God. You become like Jesus, slowly, surely, but you become like Him. And if you are a partaker of God's gift of salvation... You are to be like Him in this world, like Jesus, who set aside His privileges to become a servant to meet the needs of others. And God's love, born in your heart, it actually compels you to service. It compels you to respect everyone and seek to meet the needs of others as the opportunity presents itself. You know, as children, during Christmas, we anticipate, you know, what are we going to get? What are we going to get? Well, God and Jesus gave Himself. And we are to follow this example. This example to love and give ourselves away to others. 1 John chapter 4, verse 12. If we love one another... God dwells deeply within. And His love becomes complete. Complete in us. Perfect love. Perfect love. In the light of our fourth Advent candle, we've gotten a glimpse of the predicament God had to deal with, the, the resolution to that predicament. And we've seen this great self-sacrificial love. And in that light, if it's your desire to give yourself to the one who gave himself for you, I'd invite you right now to come and kneel before the manger over here. Going all in. Giving your all to receive that gift of reconciliation that, that God has made available to you in Christ. Don't let it pass you by. Don't let it. And if you're watching electronically this morning and, and you want to make that commitment, please email me, text me, do something to let me know so that I can pray for you too. And I also have a message for you who are a disciple of Jesus already. You who have delved deep beneath the status quo of the traditions of our Christmas celebrations and, and, and today have been reminded that we have a responsibility to give away what we have been given. You see... As God Himself was in the world, loving people in Christ, so now you, you who are indwelt with the Spirit of God, you are to go into the streets and become friends of the sinners and the drunkards and the tax collectors and the prostitutes, all the folks that you work with. Boom. Oh, well. I got to get better writers. There's just, oh well. No, but you do have 
to be Christ in the places you live and work and bring His love to others. Face it, if God's love is within you, it compels you. It's a calling that you really cannot ignore. It's always there inside. And I would suggest that, that you examine your relationship with God if it's not there. If you could care less, then maybe you, make, you need to make sure of your devotion because something might be missing. You see, one of the things that we miss out on the best that God wants to give us. We really do. See, God doesn't want things from us as much as He wants things for us. And sometimes there's things we have to do in order to receive His very best for perfect love to be found deep in our heart. And Christmas is a demonstration of how we are loved and how we are to love one another. And so in the light of this fourth Advent candle, I want to encourage you, go and be a lover. Random acts of kindness, a smile on your face, how are you doing? Oh, well, how are you really doing? Can I pray for you? That's to a perfect stranger. Perfect stranger. And all of a sudden, you've opened a door to a relationship with that person. Go in love. Go in love. Give a buck to the beggar on the street. Even if he's a con, you did it in Jesus' name. And God will take care of the rest. Go in love. You don't have to argue. You don't have to convince. You don't have to twist an arm. <coughs> Go in love. See, that's what Jesus did. And that's what Christmas is all about. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. Not only do we want to come in His name, but we want to leave in His action. We want to be empowered right here and now, first of all, to come and know you if we've never received you as our Lord and Savior if we never bent knee and become chosen to become one of your disciples to enter into your love Lord I ask that you would help that one today to draw near to you and as they draw near that you would draw near to them and open up to them the light and love of Christmas and for us who have been disciples a long time those who have heard messages like this over and over through the years Lord, help it sink anew and afresh into our hearts and lives that we might go in the power of your Holy Spirit as your agents, as little Christs in the world, into the trenches where people hurt and with your love make a difference. We ask it in Jesus' name.